Welcome into the College Football Power Hour. That's Jason Fitz. I am Caroline Fenton. And our third friend, Adam Brenneman, not here tonight. He big-timed us. He's calling the Kennesaw State MTSU game. We're recording this on Tuesday night. He's calling that game. We're awfully proud of him. Fitz, how long is too long to watch the Kennesaw State MTSU game in support of our friend Adam Brenneman? Uh, I'll wait till the highlight reel comes out and then listen to Adam on the call afterwards. That that's my like here's here's the real like I wanted to frame it like it's almost Halloween. He just dressed as Casper the friendly ghost. He's friendly, he's a ghost, he's not here. We don't see him. he's Casper. I it's it, it's fair, but no, we are incredibly happy for him. Anytime he gets to call a game, the game is better because of it. He's great at what he does. And you know that MTSU can we know MTSU well with all of our years in Nashville. Yeah. Like MTSU's got some big wins over the years. Like, there's some been been some little moments. I don't know that history will remember Kennesaw State versus MTSU, but now that I've thrown shade at it, it should be, it'll be a fun football game. It's fine. Hey, with this season, never say never, because I didn't think that Alabama Vanderbilt would be going down into the history books, yet here we are uh, in this spooky season, and we have the second week in a row where you're just going to have to apologize to any brides in your life that are getting married this weekend. Uh, you're going to have to apologize to the kids. You're not going to the pumpkin patch this weekend. You're not going to you know, the hardware store swim lessons, whatever it is people that, you know, that have normal lives do on a Saturday in the fall, you're not doing that this weekend because we've got far too many good games going down. we got Georgia and Texas, Alabama and Tennessee. Kind of feels like qualifying games for the SEC championships. So obviously we'll get into all that. But first, Fitz, I have been, I don't want to say surprised or shocked because that's not the right word. I'm really not surprised. I'm really not shocked. I think I've been overwhelmed with the commentary that has subsequently come after this Ohio State-Oregon game. Whether that's Ohio State fans kind of feeling like the sky is falling, a lot of commentary from Ohio State fans that Ryan Day can't win the big one. He was born on third base and can't get home. Ryan Day's overrated. Ryan Day is not the guy. And look, I feel like we go through this every single year. If Ohio State loses to Michigan, if Ohio State loses in the playoff, and now obviously Ohio State falling to Oregon, that is like the instant reaction is Ryan Day is not the guy. And frankly, Fitz, I think that's crazy. Yeah, no, this makes no sense. And weren't we saying the same thing about Harbaugh until he won a national championship? Oh, Harbaugh can't win the big one until he wins the big one. There was a time where people decided that they were going to craft a narrative that Peyton Manning couldn't win the big game. Like, we forget this, but Peyton Manning couldn't beat Florida, and that all of a sudden meant that there was a real problem. Then he gets to the NFL, and it's like, oh, he's losing to Brady. And it's like, well, Peyton can't win the big one until he won a Super Bowl, right? I, I, one of the dumbest things that we do as a society is we decide that there is only one outcome. And I feel like I am watching Talladega Nights and it's equally as stupid. Like, if you ain't first, you're last. is not true. Sometimes you are going to lose football games and you just need to accept that. Sometimes games don't break your way. Were there inexcusable moments in that game? Sure, there were, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But do we do this repeatedly where it's like, we just want to suddenly blame the coach? Is it the coach's fault that the quarterback had a brain fart late in the game and just absolutely didn't handle clock management some of it maybe the coach should have called timeout on the sideline sure but even through all of this like do you really think you're better off with somebody else because this is what i ask everybody to do if you hate your team's favorite coach ask yourself this if they were fired today how many other prominent programs would line up to hire him and the answer on ryan day is a bunch mm -hmm. like a bunch. And Ohio State fans are just absolutely convinced that Mike Rabel is over here in the waiting, ready to step in ha. and suddenly become the hero. I, have you watched the Titans? Did you watch the Titans with Mike Rabel as coach? You think Mike Rabel is the solution to everything that ails Ryan Day? If, if you're saying that, that's an easy way to tell me you did not watch Mike Rabel, the head coach. You only heard about Mike Rabel, the head coach. Go back, watch those games, and then come back and apologize to Ryan Day. And look, I'm glad that you brought up Mike Vrabel because that was a lot of the commentary. I, you, you used to do sports talk radio in Nashville. I used to do sports talk radio in Nashville. We're very familiar with that Mike Vrabel commentary surrounding the Tennessee Titans. But that was a big part of the of the argument of the anti-fire Vrabel crowd. The, the crowd that wanted Vrabel, Vrabel to stick around is if he gets fired, he'll get snatched up tomorrow. And my response to that was, okay, take him. Uh, may maybe he needs a fresh start somewhere else. Maybe he fits perfectly with the vision of another franchise and another owner. It's just run its course here. I think there's probably some similarities with Ryan Day and this Ohio State fan base. 
And look, I, I get it. I, I don't want to tell a fan base how they should or should not feel about their team falling short of expectations. Ohio State's still got to play Penn State, right? Like they could go 10 and 2 and college football playoff is still very much so a possibility if that's the case. But we're looking at a possibility where Ohio State does not host a playoff game. I don't think that that was really in the cards for Ohio State fans preseason. So I'm not going to tell Ohio State fans how they should or shouldn't feel. But I will say, be careful what you wish for. The grass is always greener. I always think that Gus Malzahn at Auburn is the perfect example of that. Gus Malzahn won a lot of games. Gus Malzahn beat Alabama. He just didn't beat Alabama consistently enough that it got to a point where Gus Malzahn was not good enough for Auburn. So Auburn moved on, and then they hired Brian Harson, and now the rest is history, and Auburn has been miserable ever since. And I'm not I saying that's going to happen. You say the rest happen, is history. But, Let, let's quickly say for the world, the history, the rest is history. Auburn sucks. Auburn's Auburn bad. is not only bad, Auburn is irrelevant. And I keep saying this. I scream this from the mountaintops. The only thing worse in college football than being bad is becoming irrelevant, where nobody even cares that you're bad anymore. That's Auburn. And I'm not saying Ohio State would become that, Caroline, but right. I do think you make a really fair point. that I, Look, look. what is the investment buy? When, when you turn around and you put name image like this together, what are you buying? You're buying players to give you the best chance to win. When you, bu- when you put money behind a coach, you're buying a coach that gives you the best chance to win. When you put all of your money into walking into a stadium, what are you really paying for? You're paying to watch a football game. The outcome is never guaranteed. And it's funny to me. I know that Kirby Smart has championships, and that's part of why. But like in a college football society, if Kirby Smart has the same result, loses one or two a year for the next couple of years, people are going to start clamoring for Kirby Smart's job. It's the dumbest thing that college football fans do. My hope is that the playoff changes this a little bit because if we're being honest, in the NFL, we don't see wild card coaches fired more often than not. You make the playoffs, you're still good enough to be in that that conversation. You don't get fired. I think, to your point, if Ohio State just simply gets an at-large bid this year, fans are going to be losing their minds. Not all playoff bids are created equally. And I think we're going to start seeing that unfold in the 12-team playoff. The other the other subsequent conversation that has just made me want to literally bang my head against a wall is now Sounds the bad. conversation about put yeah, I mean it's a it's a fair and rational reaction uh, in the sport. Um the now the conversation about what uh Dan Lanning did at the end of the Ohio State game, obviously purposely putting 12 men out on the field when they were on defense. So they could eat up some clock, take the five-yard penalty, and ensure that they weren't going to give, or at least give them their best opportunity to not give up a big play against Ohio State. In the moment, I thought, what what a boneheaded coaching move. Looking back, very, very smart. Chess, not checkers from Dan Lanning. Now there's a lot of conversation of, should that be allowed? Should there be a rule against coaches kind of manipulating the rule book and manipulating end of game situations like that? And I don't know how you feel about it, Fitz, but look, it's strategy. And a coach okay. with a better strategy wins. I got no problem with it. I have no problem with it, but I also have no problem with college football now turning around and saying, hey, that's a loophole we didn't consider we should fix. Like, there's a very easy solution to this now that we've seen it. The easy solution is if there's a defensive penalty in the last two minutes of the game, after the penalty yardage is given, the clock is reset to where it was before that play. Like, don't allow the play to happen. That's such an easy fix to this because otherwise, man, I just do this over and over and over again. Like, I put 15 men on the field. Forget it. We'll put 15 men on the field when there's four seconds left. Let it turn into two seconds or one second. Like, you do this over and over and over again. It can become a problem. So I, I think it was great strategy by Lanning. And I think that's brilliant coaching. And it speaks to coaches that have analytics and studies and numbers. And they know these things and they wait for these things. Brilliant move. I also think it's fair and just for college football now to say, okay, now that that cat's out of the bag, how do we prevent that be- from becoming a normal part of the end of games? And the easiest way, like I said, to do that is simply ensure that if you have 12 men on the field, if you have a procedural penalty in the last two minutes of the game, the yardage is given and the clock for the game is returned to where it was before the snap of the football. I think that's fair. I think that's totally fair. Because you're all right that any loophole it's going to be taken advantage of. I think it kind of goes along with the the faking injuries in college football, which I think is a very slippery slope 
something that I'm incredibly sensitive to because this is a violent game and sometimes injuries happen. It's just unfortunate that it seemed fairly obvious at times that some teams have taken advantage of that. But uh, overall, I don't have any issue whatsoever with a coach manipulating the rule book to to aid their team. I got I got no problem with it whatsoever. Who would have thought, you know, the, the injury match one, up with two top five one, teams causing controversy. The injury one is, is a little concerning. The only thing I'd say, like, here's the hardest part about the injury one. Because you're right, faking the injury is gross. What's it's even gross. more gross is turning around and implying that an injury is being faked when we have no idea. And that's mm-hmm. just... I feel dirty if I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh, man, that bum, he can get up and play. And then after the game, they're like, oh, he's lost for the season with the torn whatever. It's like, well, turns out we picked the wrong time to yell about that. Like, it's such a slippery, slow proposition of picking when we're going to lecture that because you don't know if the penalty is legit or the penalty is not legit. Again, if college football really wanted to fix this rule, then you could require any player that's taken off the field due to injury to miss the rest of the drive. That would change some of this. It's like, hey, you cannot come back in until there's been a change of possession. Now, all of a sudden, you are deterring the want to, like, sit out one play, you still bring somebody back in. Sit out a whole drive, now you're taking risk. You can't yeah. can't put that player back on the field until there's a change of possession. Now, all of a sudden, your best players are certainly never going to put themselves in that situation, and your depth players can't put themselves in that situation. Again, college football, call me. I'll be the star. I'll take over. New commissioner of college football. New commish. Hire him. Hire the man. Jason Fitz, college football commish. Um... Fitz, we got a new AP poll. Texas stays at number one, deservedly so. Oregon up to the number two spot. Penn State at three. Ohio State falls to four. Georgia rounds out the top five. But who is too high in these AP poll rankings? Uh, Okay, so easy one here on too high is Penn State. And I'll go back to what we were just talking about. Oregon played Ohio State in an instant classic, as we love to say. Oregon played Ohio State where I feel like that game could have gone either way the entire way. And I watched I watched every second of that thinking, I'm watching two of the best teams in the country. Mm-hmm. I watched every second of Penn State and never thought, this looks like a college football championship caliber. Like, look, Penn State's good. They're good, but are they the number three team in the country? No. Am I willing to knock, I, like, wins and losses matter? Yes. But am I willing to knock Oregon up to two, bring Oregon up to two, I should say, knock Ohio State down to four just to move Penn State up? No. I'm not because I think, frankly, right now, Ohio State would beat Penn State. And it's that simple for me. So I think Penn State's too high. And it's what we talked about last week whenever so many teams at the top lost and fell out of the top three or the top five. And we thought, okay, well, if Texas is number one and before losing to Oregon, Ohio State is number two, does anyone feel really good about Oregon being at three or Penn State being at four? Because I didn't. But somebody's got to be at three. Somebody's got to be at four. That's not really how I feel about this. It's not, oh, we'll put Penn State at three because somebody's got to be at three. I think that was a close enough game that there is a very fair argument to be made for a 5-1 and one Ohio State to be above an undefeated Penn State. But again, I mean, like, these, these rankings are not the end-all be-all. These rankings here in about a month or so are going to mean nothing. But it is crazy to see how weak to weak and how fickle some of these rankings can be. One week, a one loss team is the greatest gift to the sport of college football. And another week, dead to me. Yeah, and you always pointed out smartly, and we'll continue to yell about the college football playoff committee, something when we get our first rankings in a couple of weeks, I'm excited for, I've covered it for six years. I, I think interesting that we always credit, you know, quality losses. Is there a more quality loss then on the road to the number two team in the country in the last second of a game. Like, we want to talk about quality loss. Like, Ohio State had about the most quality loss that you could ever have in that. And usually the committee really puts gravity towards that. So I wonder if that will, if the committee would value it differently. Who's too high to you, Caroline? Michigan. Mm. For the second you week you, in a row. You want to be able to see a, a pass for once? One pass? And I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll continue to bang on the table for this. Why is Michigan in the top 25? What has Michigan done to be in the top 25? Michigan is now one of two two lost teams in the top 25. It's Michigan and Ole Miss. 
I don't, I, I don't, if Michigan and Ole Miss played on a neutral site today, I think Ole Miss would win by three touchdowns. I, I look at so many other two loss teams uh, across college football, Vanderbilt to Arizona State, that have much more quality wins, that have much more impressive performances, and frankly, much more exciting brands of football than Michigan has. It's, it's, uh, to me, I, the only way that I can justify it is, Maybe AP voters are overvaluing that win against USC, which now doesn't look like that great of a win. And two, it's Michigan, so they have to be in the top 25. That's the only way that I can rationalize it. Michigan is not a good football team. And that's okay. They're in transition. That's okay. I don't think they deserve to be in the top 25 as one of the only two two two-loss teams in this top 25. I don't love a disgustingly one-dimensional team being in the top 25. That's not what I think. I'd rather have a team that's mediocre on both sides of the ball represented in the top 25, where at least you're saying, okay, there's balance to complementary football. When you literally just cannot throw, if you take on a good team, which is part of what you have to do here, you have to, if this, then that. If Michigan takes on a good team that's even remotely capable of taking away the run, they get beaten by four touchdowns. And and once Michigan is in a small deficit, what are they going to do? So I think your your point's a, a really fair one that, It just doesn't pass much of the eye test. And the USC win, again, we have to stress this. It's not, it's about who USC has turned out to be, right? USC at this point is not a top 25 team. That's part of why as much as Penn State fans were in my menchies when I said for Yahoo Sports over the week, like, hey, I wouldn't have moved them up to three. We beat USC at USC. Right. Let's change the headline a little bit. Penn State goes on the road and beats an unranked team on the West Coast. Okay, I don't really give a damn that that unranked team happens to be a big brand in college Mm -hmm. football. That unranked team is an unranked team. So for me, like we've got to start looking at USC and replacing the name USC with the resume of USC when we talk about any team the rest of the year. Like if you're looking at Notre Dame's remaining schedule, let's be clear. Their remaining schedule will not give them any good out of the USC matchup. They need to hope the service academies continue to kick ass because USC is an irrelevant opponent at this point in this season. I don't care how they've lost their games. They're unranked. They have three losses. They're not a good football team. So if you're going to prop Michigan up and say, well, look at that gutsy last effort, last second win, I'd look at it and say, oh my God, it took everything and a last second heroic, oh my God, ending to beat an unranked team. That does not feel like a great resume to me. What a wild world we live in when the Army game is a much stronger resume resume game than Florida State and USC. I love it. It's disgusting. My, well, no, I want every ounce of it. Can I give you I one more it. team that might be a little too high to me? Yes, yes, and yes. Now, I'm throwing a little shade here, but we watched them. Iowa State, does Iowa State really feel like a top 10 football team to you right now? Like, when you watch Iowa State, I, I know they haven't really beaten anybody, and they've gone through it so far, like... I want to like Iowa State. I just, I don't know. Like West Virginia isn't all that. Baylor's not all that. Like you just keep going through. Like, it just hasn't hit me in a way that I look at Iowa State and think, "Oh God, I can't wait for that Iowa State playoff game." It's fair, and I have to ask myself. So Iowa State as a top ten team, as an undefeated top ten team, what has Iowa State done to deserve to be in the top ten over BYU? BYU also is uh, is undefeated. I mean, BYU beat a pretty solid Kansas State team. I mean, I don't think either of their schedules or either of their resumes are overwhelmingly impressive and difficult. It's not like I look at either of their schedules and say, wow, you know, that's a gauntlet. But why Iowa State getting the edge over BYU or really any of these other remaining undefeated teams fits? Yeah, and frankly, if you look at things like the – I just looked it up to make sure I had the number right. If you look at the football power index, the, the committee also likes the FPI, as it were. Iowa State sits at 6-0 and right now with an FPI of 13.3. For point of reference, Indiana 6-0 and with an FPI of 14.1. So, like, if you start to look at, at that resume – it doesn't scream of, oh, my God, look at the dominance. It, this almost feels like a pity party invite where it's like, hey, we really want to have somebody from the Big 12 that we can start to bank on. So uh, we'll just put Iowa State up there and we'll see how it goes. Bank on and Big 12 should not be in the same sentence. Facts. 
Facts. That, that, that confra, if you're, if you are putting any sort of investment, financial, emotional, physical, psychological, spiritual investment into that conference, thoughts and prayers, T's and P's. But that's a great thing. It's fun. It's a conference of parody. It's a conference that you could tell me any team comes out of it in the college football playoff and I'll say, okay, I, I, I believe it. That makes sense. Um, if we're going to talk about too high, I also have to, to excuse me, about too low. I got to give credit to some teams that I do believe are uh, are too low in these rankings. Two teams okay. that I will give you for similar reasons. Clemson at 10 and Texas yeah. A&M at 14 feel far too low. Obviously, Clemson loses that week one game against Georgia. Texas A&M loses that week one game to, to Notre Dame. But since then, I think both of those teams have proven all of us wrong for counting those teams out after their week one losses. Like Notre Dame is above Texas A&M. I think it's been long enough since that game to say that Notre Dame has to be above Texas A&M. Because since then, Notre Dame has lost to Northern Illinois. And since then, Texas A&M has absolutely dismantled a top 10 Missouri team at home. I think I think that's far more impressive than Notre Dame beating a now unranked Louisville team. I think that losing to Notre Dame in a in a dogfight, a close game, wasn't a blowout. I think losing that game, I think that Texas A&M deserves more credit. And I think Clemson deserves more credit for what they have done. Because Texas A&M is going to get an opportunity with their schedule to redeem themselves. In an SEC schedule where they play... Texas, they play LSU in just a couple of weeks. They're going to be able to get an opportunity to say, no, 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 we are legit. Because right now, Texas A&M has a fast track to get to Atlanta and compete the SEC title game. Clemson doesn't have that same opportunity because their schedule is so light. But I think we have to give credit where credit is due and give Clemson credit for absolutely walloping every single game and every single team on their schedule so far. So I I don't understand if Iowa State and Clemson played in a neutral field today, I would take Clemson. If Texas A&M and 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 Iowa State played on a neutral site today, I would take Texas A&M. Honestly, Fitz, if Texas A&M and Tennessee played on a neutral site today, I would take Texas A&M. They look like such a complete team, and I think we just written them off too early. So what you just said there, by the way, I agree with these. These are the two uh, most underrated teams. What you've said there speaks to one of the problems that I think a lot of times the voters have in the AP poll. And the problem is early in the season, some people get too much benefit of the doubt. But when you see a big result early on, it feels like the teeter totter or the seesaw, depending on where you grew up, goes the opposite way. And it goes so hard, like Clemson losing all of a sudden we did it on this show. Hey, Clemson's done. Look at how bad it is. Texas A&M losing the way they did it. We did it on this show. Man, look at how bad this is. But one of the responsibilities you have when you cover college football with no preseason is you have to be willing to re-examine what you see. I think if you just clean slated and you watched all of the body of work of Texas A&M with the context of week one versus the context of now, it's pretty clear that Texas A&M is a much better football team. To your point, on a neutral field today, Texas A&M versus Notre Dame, I would take Texas A&M. I would put my money on A&M at this point. They're hot. They're playing really well. They're playing, again, take a shot. Complimentary football. All the things that you need to see from a team that is, and they're moving the line of scrimmage, which you know for me is like an addiction. I, at this point, if I watch a team that at the snap of the ball offensively moves the line of scrimmage in their favor and plus territory from the outset or defensively pushes it back from the outset, that's a team that I believe in. I'm not smart enough to be able to tell you why an offensive line plays great. I talked to former offensive linemen to do that. But I am smart enough to watch the line of scrimmage and see where it moves. Texas A&M, on both sides of the ball, moves the line of scrimmage. I think that makes them dangerous. The problem is so many people still sit there and say, well, no, 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 I'm convinced that they're no good because of what happened in week one, that they're not willing to re-examine the opinions. One thing we will always do on this show is re-examine our opinions because more, more evidence means facts change. And a yeah. and is a better team today than they were week one. It deserves to be acknowledged. Clemson is a better team than they were week one. It deserves to be acknowledged. And I'm with you. I would take both of them neutral field over Iowa State, probably by a touchdown at this point. Just like we were saying about USC and Michigan, it's okay 
to say that these big time brands just are not living up to expectations, that they're not as good as we thought that they were going to be. In that same breath, it's okay to allow teams to get better. It's okay to allow teams. To, to give teams the credit that they deserve, even if you had already made your mind up the otherwise. Uh, who is just right, Fitz? Who is exactly where they belong? So it's funny because I think there's a lot of so far in this. They've gotten this week a lot better than I thought they would. So, you know, for me, when I look at who's just right, I think most of the league is most of the mm -hmm. uh, the world is just right. Uh, for me, also, I'm looking at a team that we thought was going to be really good that hasn't necessarily, but I think they're just right where they are, and that's Nebraska. I know early on in the year, Nebraska is now in the other receiving vote category. And I want to bring Nebraska up because Nebraska is playing pretty well right now. And I think I, I see Nebraska fans on social media freaking out about the fact that they're in others receiving votes and they haven't managed to find their way into the top 25 yet. Much like some Vandy fans, although there's only like two of them, are out there saying the same thing. Yes, I Both appreciate Vandy that. fans again. Well, there's one account that every time I say something mean about Vandy, is like, come get your boy. And then nobody ever comes and gets me. Guess what? I'm not the minority or majority minority on that one. The, the one thing I'd say about some of these others receiving votes uh, group is that I feel like, frankly, they are where they belong. Right. And that to me is significant. Let them play their way into it. The only other team that I'd say in the top 25 that I looked at and said feels right right there is Notre Dame. But that was before Notre Dame went through what we now know is a massive injury that will change the entire scope of their defensive side of the ball. So knowing that the college football playoff committee, again, I will mention this, is specifically told in writing to consider players that are no longer eligible to play when they decide what the ranking of the teams are. I think Notre Dame is appropriately ranked. I think Notre Dame will be docked by the committee because of the injury when they get to that point. It's a very, very fair point. Benjamin Morrison out for the rest of the season. I hate that. I hate yep. that so much since he's, that's probably the last time that we'll see him in a Notre Dame uniform. I would expect that he's declaring for the NFL draft. I hate that for this Notre Dame team. I'll add another team that I think is right where they need to be, and that's Missouri at 19. They're a one-loss team. And if you wanted to make an argument for Missouri to be in that 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 area, I think that you probably could. You probably could. Missouri has not done anything that has been overly impressive all season long. They played Boston College close. They went to overtime, and it was a missed field goal from Vanderbilt to squeak by the Commodores, which, you know, might look like a better now. looks impressive. Now. And it did a couple of weeks ago. And then they got absolutely pummeled in their first true test of the season on the road at Texas A&M. I still think that Missouri has the makings of being a good team because we know what Brady Cook can do. He did it last season. They bring back all of their receivers and Theo Weiss and Mookie Cooper and Luther Burden and TBD on, uh, on Luther Burden's status. I know he got a little bit banged up this past week against UMass and the oddest and most peculiar game ever scheduled in the history of college football. Um, so I still think they have the makings of being a good team. I still think that they deserve credit for what they've done and how good they can be and deserve to be a top 25 team. But I don't think that they deserve to be anywhere near the top 10 or the top 15. So I think Missouri, even at a five and one team, uh, is, is exactly where they need to be at 19. I love that call by you. And by the way, that's because of the big loss to a valid opponent. Like when you haven't played anybody and then you didn't show up the one time you did, you will be docked for that. Yeah, that's uh, big games. Show up in big games. That's that is what matters. And it's also the games that everybody watches. Like nobody cares what you did against UMass. Nobody cares what you did against does. Uh, Adam St. Teresa's to this School of the Blind. Nobody A Adam's watches gonna that. Listen, Adam's going to be like, how are you guys docking these games? They're still classic games. But Brenneman's out there watching National Auto Diesel College take on, you know, Central Connecticut. So, you know, I, I get it. I get it. That, that It's fair. But Adam's going to yell at us for this take. That's fine. He can yell. I love Central Connecticut State, okay? All credit in the world. <laughs> great program. Great people. Sure. Great players. But if this is a, the AP poll is essentially a popularity contest. And if you aren't playing in the most popular game of the week or one of the top five most popular games of the week, ain't nobody care about that. Ain't nobody watching you drop 50 on a junior high team. Ain't nobody cares. Um, okay, it's a weird season in college football. Obviously, 
conference realignment, playoff expansion, and we're seeing that kind of come to fruition with this season, the wins and the losses and the upsets and the crazy things that have happened. We're also seeing that reflected in the Heisman Trophy odds. We'll hit some of that coming up next after a quick break. So Fitz, I wanted to take a look at some Heisman odds because I've said it a few times. I don't know if it's been on the podcast or just talking with friends. This season feels very 2007-esque. Of course, the season that I always reference whenever just weird and freaky things happen, like the number one team losing to an unranked team, top 10 teams losing to teams they have no business losing to. The Heisman Trophy odds right now, with a group of five running back with the overwhelming best odds, feels so 2007-y. 2007-y. Yeah, and I don't know what's more stunning. Group of five, running back, like Heisman favorite, all of these things together. Ashton Genty is a delight. Mm-hmm. And let me make it clear, we are having a pro Ashton Genty conversation. This is not about Ashton totally. Genty. Ashton Genty is basically Derrick Henry to college football. It's insane to watch. It's insane to watch how fast he is. It's incredible to watch players make a business decision when they decide just not to try and tackle him. It's also incredible to watch players trying to tackle him and then taking angles that turn out to be very poor because they haven't anticipated how fast he is while he's also a human bowling ball. So, like, Ashton Genty is incredible. This is not about Ashton Genty. But he's a running back, which is a devalued position in college football and football in general. He plays for Boise State, who right now, yes, is the number 15 in the team in the country. But let's not get it twisted. They're not going to get the street cred that Georgia and Alabama get. He's not a quarterback. Like, you look at all of these different things that we associate with the Heisman. Ashton Genty is none of those things. And he's still the odds-on favorite. Like, that's the stunning thing to me. And I think it speaks to the fact that we're still waiting for a team to come out and give us the clear-cut, easy answer. If Texas had done everything they'd done this year with Quinn Ewers, I believe Quinn Ewers would probably be the favorite. But the fact is, the success of Arch Manning makes it easy to say, hey, this isn't about a quarterback, so now you eliminate them. Now, all of a sudden, if the argument is the best quarterback on the best team, that's going to be hard to find. It really becomes Ashton Genty versus Travis Hunter for me, who currently sits at 8-1 to one odds. I mean, that, Travis Hunter, Ashton Genty, non-quarterbacks, I think two have to be two of the biggest favorites. I'm so sick and tired of this being a quarterback on the best team award. And look, sometimes that's warranted and sometimes that's fair. Sometimes the quarterback on the best team in the country deserves to be the Heisman Trophy winner because that guy is the best player in the country. But I, I, I've i gotten sick and tired of these unwritten rules of the Heisman Trophy. I view it Facts. as basically the, the MVP of college football who has played a, uh, a bigger role for their respective team than any other player for any other team in the country. Who is doing something that no one else in college football can do or has done? That was a big conversation last season with Jaden Daniels. LSU had three losses. Would that disqualify Jaden Daniels from winning the Heisman Trophy? And I thought, are you people crazy? LSU would have a losing record if it wasn't for Jaden Daniels doing Superman kind of things. In 2022, we had what I thought were the two best quarterbacks in all of college football without an invitation to New York City. It was Bryce Young and Hendon Hooker because both of their teams had two losses. I think that's unfair. And that is no disrespect to Caleb Williams who won it and all of the guys that ended up in New York. Absolutely fair and absolutely warranted and justified. I just don't like that it's now become a you have to win a certain number of games kind of a war. I do understand the argument of wins are a quarterback stat. But I, I, I more so lean toward, are you doing something unheard of? Are you doing something at Boise State that makes the entire country pay attention to Boise State? Because I think that's pretty darn impressive. I think your point about Travis Hunter is very well taken because – He's doing something that nobody in college football has done or can do. He doesn't just play both sides. He plays both sides at an incredibly high level and could be drafted at either corner or wide receiver and play either position in the NFL. I also had to give credit to Dylan Gabriel. I think Saturday night against Ohio State was his Heisman moment. And we have not been easy on Dylan Gabriel on this podcast. We have not been easy on Oregon because... We've always asked Oregon, okay, pull away from the teams that you should beat. Stop playing with your food. When your foot's on the throat, clamp down. We wanted to see more from Dylan Gabriel and this Oregon team. 
we saw Dylan Gabriel against the number two team in the country play the best game, I don't want to say of his career, but I'll say with certainty the best game in an Oregon uniform. And that, and on a national stage, a game in which everyone in America is watching, uh, Dylan Gabriel's Heisman odds has skyrocketed, and I think that's that's justified. Well, when we did our preseason predictions for Yahoo, uh, I predicted Oregon to win the national championship. And when we were asked our Yahoo uh, Heisman pick, I picked Dylan Gabriel. And my logic was simple. I think Oregon's going to win the national championship, which means Dylan Gabriel is going to have to play lights out. That's just the way it works. I stand by that logic, like the old, you know, high school thing where you had to show your math. I stand by the math. That being said, if I had a Heisman vote today, it would not be for Dylan Gabriel. My vote would be run in and sprinted it with Travis Hunter written in huge block letters on the card because I don't think wins and losses are a quarterback stat. I don't think wins and losses are a wide receiver stat. I don't think wins and losses are an individual stat. There are 53 active players in an NFL roster. We do the same thing every time. We're like, well, this quarterback won this game or lost this game. I hate it. You're talking about 100 scholarship kids that are all working their ass off trying to get the, a win on the field, and we want to make it about one player. I refuse to do that. To me, what I'm asking myself is quite simply this. Who was the one, oh my God, can't miss, impacted games, but also just did things that had you shaking in your boots all week player? Who's the guy yeah. that you spent all week saying, I don't know if we can win this game because we have to take on Ashton Genty. That's a fair answer. We have to take on Dylan Gabriel. It is a fair answer because he's the quarterback, but there are other weapons there. To me, Ashton Genty and Travis Hunter stand out because they are what I associate the fear factor, the game wreckers for their respective teams. And for Travis Hunter to be a game wrecker on two sides of the ball, for him to not be the Heisman favorite shows the absolute stupidity and irrelevance of the Heisman. Like, I don't, I don't want to get us in trouble with the Heisman committee. I don't want anybody to get mad at this. But let's be honest. If your award was worth anything, then it would clearly go to the best player. And when the best player right now is not not only the best in his position on the offensive side of the ball, but he's arguably the best in his in his position on the defensive side of the ball. If he's not a front runner for the best player in college football competition, then the best player in college football competition is faulted. It, it just becomes the best quarterback in college and football that's competition. That's stupid. They're being it, it, have, have a different award. Well, there are different awards for the best quarterback in college football. Yet the Heisman still just kind of trends toward that way as well. And uh, in a Colorado game the other day, ESPN put up the uh, uh, the graphics, the little lower thirds for impact players, offense and defense. Impact player for Colorado offensively, Travis Hunter. Uh, impact player for Colorado defensively, Travis Hunter. Like this guy is just, he's a freak. And to be fair, this is not a quarterback hate take. We love our quarterbacks. Whenever we have an opportunity to vote for a non-quarterback in an award like this, I'll take it because it doesn't come around very often. The uh, the first day, of I learned this from our, our good buddy, Harry Douglas, who played for Louisville, Ring of Honor there, Hall of Famer for Louisville, played years in the NFL. And Harry told me that the first day of installation at the college and NFL level, when they went in, to their meetings the first day, the first thing that they spent any time practicing or working on in film room was great game records. So day one was the installation of how do we get around their game records, right? And if you don't have any game records, the whole week preparation is different because now you don't have to worry about that. What What's alarming to me every single Saturday is all I can think about is when they go into their practice, when they get their first group of film on Monday, when they get everything that they're going to start digesting for the week, the offensive side of the ball, the offensive coordinator is going to come in and say, who's our game record? And the answer is going to be Travis Hunter. We got to get around this corner. Do not let this corner get involved in the game. At the same day, at the same time, the same conversation from the defensive coordinator is going to be, who's the game record that we can't let beat us? And the answer is going to be Travis Hunter at wide receiver. To have the guy that both sides of the ball are changing their practices around to try and stop, that's Heisman worthy. Very well said. Very well said. The Heisman is supposed to go to the best and most impactful player in all of college football. I don't know how you can say that Travis Hunter doesn't fall into that category. Am I going to say that he's going to win the Heisman Trophy today? No. But he's putting up Heisman-like stats. This is what this award was made for. I do want to take a look at the playoffs. 
We've got some massive games coming up this weekend. And I'm not going to call them college football playoff disqualifying kind of games because in matches of the heavyweights, I don't think it's fair to say that it's a disqualifier, but uh, got some implications in the college football playoff. We'll hit that after a quick break. Okay, Fitz, if the season ended today, Tuesday, October 15th, the day that we're recording this podcast, the college football playoff would look as follows. Now, I understand that the conference championship games have yet to be played. I will defer to the team, the highest ranked team in each conference as the quote unquote conference champion on today, October 15th. So your, your playoff would look like Texas, Oregon, Miami, and Iowa State as the four highest rated conference champions, and they would all get a first round bye. So in the playoffs, in the first round, we would get Boise State at Penn State, Tennessee at Ohio State, Clemson at Georgia, and LSU at Alabama. So that's just what it would look like today. Everything is going to change by the time we hop in this podcast this time next week. Obviously, Alabama and Tennessee play this weekend. Georgia and Texas play this weekend. All of these teams, a majority of these teams in the same conference, are going to play each other. There is going to be some cannibalism. What are What's a team, maybe some teams that I just mentioned that you are not buying as being in uh, pl- true playoff contenders and teams that you don't think will be there come December? Okay, so... As we go through the list, I think there are easy ones we know we buy. Like, I buy Texas. You buy Texas? We buy Texas? Can we put Texas I buy in? Texas. Sure, we'll put Texas in. I buy Oregon. I, I, I mean, yeah. Oregon gets a big win. I buy Oregon. I'm not saying they have to win the conference, but I buy Oregon. Where it gets way trickier for me is the next one. It's Penn State. Like, I, I by the eye test, I think Ohio State's better than Penn State right now. Like, we look through the rest of the season. And you look what you're going to have to get through. I want to buy Penn State. They have they have wiggle room. In theory, they could lose a couple of games. I just if if I'm on neutral field right now, I'd take Ohio State, and then they would, as we stand, then Penn State would have to play Oregon in the Big Ten championship game. If that all if everything worked out right, I, I, it gets a little tricky for me on that one. I I don't know where are you on Penn State or Ohio State. Are you buying either of them as a Sherlock playoff team? I buy Ohio State. Because if I'm looking at that Penn State, Ohio State game that we're going to see here in a couple of weeks, as of today, I like Ohio State to win that game. Mm -hmm. So I would give Ohio State the edge there. I think all three of them could make it. I I would put my money on both of them. Just because outside of Ohio State, I don't see any other game on Penn State's schedule that could give them, that I can look at today and say, well, that's going to be a tricky game, or this could be potentially a game that knocks Penn State out of the playoffs. At Wisconsin, Washington, at Purdue, Minnesota, Maryland, sure, they could lose any of those games, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to say today that those are games that they should lose. So I'm buying, I'm buying Oregon, Ohio State, and Penn State, and that the Big Ten gets at least three teams in the playoff. I, I think you're right, actually, because think about this. Penn State, Ohio State, they play. Ohio they play. State wins that game. We both think that, that Ohio State wins that game. That means Ohio State has the tiebreaker. Ohio State would face Oregon in the Big Ten championship game. So Penn State, with one loss, doesn't have to play in the championship game. Mm-hmm. They're going to get – yes, they're in at that point. Like it, it feels like they're in. What gets weirder is then if Ohio State has two losses, they're probably still in that. Seat. I'm with you. I will buy that. I will buy all three of them to the college football playoff. I like that. I'd buy Georgia to the college football playoff. You buy in Georgia? Yes. And I oh, say it hesitation. hesitant. I say oh. it with some hesitation because Georgia plays Texas this weekend, and Texas mm-hmm. looks like the most complete team in the country. Georgia still has to play Tennessee, which there's a lot of questions about this Tennessee team. Now their their offense is kind of sputtered playing actual SEC defenses, but that's never easy going into Neyland Stadium. Or, I think that game's in Athens. I take that back. What does Georgia do that is spectacular? Where on Georgia's team, on Georgia's roster, are they elite? I mean, I think they have a good, uh, a good quarterback, but he's thrown five interceptions in the last three games. I think they're really good everywhere. They're really good everywhere, but they're not everywhere. great. But they're not great everywhere. I'll give you that. They're not yeah. great. And we have seen Georgia throughout the entirety of this season 
not play four full quarters in a single game against an FBS opponent. It really came alive in the second half against Clemson. They won that game. They didn't really do anything against Alabama until that second half. Against Auburn, that game was what, 10 to 7, 4, 8, 10 to 6, whatever it was at halftime. And then Georgia pulled away in the second half. Georgia let Mississippi State right back in the game this past weekend. Georgia was a 34 and a half point favorite against Mississippi State. They won handedly, they still won by 10 points. But as a 34 point favorite at home and a Mississippi State team that I think is consensus the worst team in the conference, and you win by 10. And their true freshman quarterback throws for more yards than he has in his entire career, short career so far. Like there's there's just questions about this Georgia team. I still say, like, if I have to put my money on it, yes or no, will Georgia make the playoff? I say yes. But there's some questions about this Georgia team. I want to see them play a more complete game. I want to see them be a more complimentary team. They Georgia's got to go to Texas. They got to go to Ole Miss in a few weeks, and they have Tennessee. I are you talking me out of Georgia in the college football? Are you talking me out of Georgia in the college look, football playoff? Like look, they oh. could win all three of those games. They could also lose two of them. Oh, I don't think that they this, lose all three. But the, I no. It, eh, but maybe maybe we see a different side of Texas this weekend against Georgia. It's a fair critique of this Texas team that they haven't played the most intimidating opponents. And this secondary, this Texas secondary, I think is probably the one big area that's a question mark. Well, who have they played? Michigan, who cannot throw the football. Mississippi State, that we just said is the worst team in the SEC. And Oklahoma, that can't throw the football. So this is going to be a huge test for Texas coming up this weekend. Maybe we learn a little bit more about both Texas and Georgia. But as of right now, there is a path for Georgia to miss out altogether. I guess what gets difficult is if I believe Texas, Georgia, Alabama, if I believe all three of them are going to make it, that's a bit of a stretch. Then what am I doing with LSU? And what am I doing eventually with Texas A&M, who you mentioned earlier, controls their own destiny? Like uh, Texas A&M can win their way right into the entire college football play. Like, would you buy right now Texas A&M to be a college football playoff team? Yes. I am buying Texas A&M being a college football team, a college football playoff team. Over LSU. Uh, LSU is a flawed team, and LSU on their schedule, there's plenty of opportunities for slip ups. Arkansas this weekend, I think, is one of them. Texas AM, their remaining schedule is really not that difficult. They go on the road to Mississippi State this weekend. They host LSU in a series where I want to say the last six or seven years, the home team has won that game. So Texas AM gets to LSU at home. They avoid going to Death Valley at night. They go on the road to South Carolina. Good team, not a great team. And then New Mexico State and then at Auburn. And then we could be looking at both a Texas and a Texas A&M team that are undefeated in SEC play in the final week of the season. Okay, so we're you're talking about like just sheer numbers here. If we already did Oregon, Penn State, Ohio State, all three of them mm -hmm. making, you know, making the college football playoff. And now we're trying to put Texas, Georgia, Alabama, Texas A&M in. Are we comfortable with that? That's that's seven of the spots from two conferences. Didn't we kind of think it would be like that anyways yeah, with the I SEC mean, and the Big Ten? So we know that we know the group of five gets their automatic bid, which I think right now most people think will go to Boise State. Are you in on Boise State to the uh, highest representative from the group of five? Totally. Where things okay. stand right now. Yeah. All right. So where things so stand... Eight. That's eight. We need somebody from the ACC. Uh, there, there, there is an ACC champion we haven't mentioned there. So that really comes down to what are we taking, Miami or Clemson? And I, like Cam Ward is as good as anybody. I can't get the three quarters against Cal that were awful out of my head. Clemson has played a bad half. Uh, Miami's played a bad three quarters. I don't know. Right now, neutral field, Miami, Clemson. I might actually lean Clemson in that game. Am I crazy? I No, I don't think you're crazy at all. I think I would too. And maybe it's not fair, but I mean, Miami they squeaked past some not so great teams over the past couple of weeks that they they have struggled to hold on to leads. I mean, it came down to a questionable targeting call against Cal, a questionable no catch call against Virginia Tech. I don't know how much I trust this Miami team, but 
I could see both Clemson and Miami getting in the playoff. Why not? All right. So if we want to put Clemson and Miami in the playoffs, then who's winning the uh, the only thing we need a Big 12 champion? Are, uh-huh. are you buying Iowa State? No, I'm not buying anything with the Big 12. Well, somebody has to win the Big 12. Somebody I mean, has to. I'm not going to put money on, on Iowa State today, but I think there could be five or six teams from the Big 12 that could yeah. that could be in contention to win the Big 12. I think it's I don't think it's crazy I, to think that a three-loss Big 12 team could find themselves in the Big 12 championship game. I still like BYU. I, I think out of yeah. the, if I'm going to have to make a choice today, I would I would take Iowa State out and I put BYU in. I would I would probably do the same. Okay, I would probably so that's do the oh, same. That's and, eleven of our twelve spots. We have eleven of our twelve spots. No Brenneman, so it's just friends here. Is it Notre Dame? Is Notre Dame making the college football playoff in this beautiful scenario? You and I have said no repeatedly, but at this point, I don't have Tennessee in yet. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we obviously we, we've taken LSU out of the equation. We've taken Iowa State out of the equation. We've taken Tennessee out of the equation. We haven't accounted for Notre Dame yet. Should you know, Colorado we, we, be out of the conversation? I mean, we're not getting two teams from the Big 12, are we? What kind of what kind of I don't think so. I wouldn't put money on it. I, are we I, taking SMU out of the conversation maybe a little bit prematurely? No, I think we're appropriately taking SMU out of the conversation. We're <laughs> prematurely taking UNLV out of the conversation. We're prematurely, but SMU. Uh, shout out I, to no, UNLV. They should I, get I in no matter what. Take a shot. Just as America's uh, sweetheart. This really becomes, to me, in this moment, Tennessee versus Notre Dame. Like, if we're the college football playoff committee, we're trying to figure out, are we putting Tennessee in or are we putting Notre Dame in? By the time this whole thing is said and done, are you putting Tennessee in or are you putting Notre Dame in? I disagree. Okay. I think is it Tennessee or is it Alabama? I don't. Oh, so you're not you're, you're not sold on Bama. I'm not sold on Bama. Uh, hell no, I'm not sold on Bama. Did you just see Alabama barely squeak by South Carolina? No, at that's fair. Home. That's but fair. I I haven't. I'm not going to write Alabama in the playoff. I think that this game coming up this weekend, Alabama goes on the road to Tennessee. I think that's massive in terms of playoff implications. I'm not going to say the loser is out of contention, but I think that the winner has the fast track to getting one of the three or four spots for the SEC. Uh, okay, but here's the thing. Last week when we talked about, you know, we talked about Ole Miss LSU, you said something mm-hmm. there that I thought was really important. Nobody was going to qualify for the college football playoff, but somebody was going to get disqualified from the college football playoff. I don't know, as much as I would love to see you know, total chaos. You know me. I'm an agent of chaos. I have no favorite teams. You pick up your second loss, whether you're Alabama or you're Tennessee, you pick up your second loss. I don't know that you can't come back from that. And and frankly, if we're really talking about must win, if you're Georgia and you pick up your second loss, man, I think the, the, the heavy lift out of two is so wild to me that I do believe that the losers of those two key games this weekend – might be looking at elimination. Very well could be. And I think if you're an Alabama or a Tennessee fan, you are rooting like hell for Texas to win that game. Because if you have a one-loss Georgia team and a one-loss Texas team, that's probably your SEC championship game. Just assuming that both of those teams take care of business the, the rest of the way. But if you have a, a Texas team that got past Georgia, I know they still have tough games down the stretch. I think you can almost write Texas in to the SEC championship game. Knocking on wood. I know injuries happen. I know weird things happen in college football. But a two-loss Alabama team that lost to Vanderbilt and a Tennessee team that's looked less than impressive over the past couple of weeks, well, where's your marquee win? Does it come mm. at LSU? Is is that is a win at LSU going to be enough on your resume? Or is the college football playoff committee going to fall in love with the fact that Alabama dominated Georgia in the first half and won that game? Like that's where I think those things matter. What does the college football playoff committee prioritize? What do they value? Big wins or quality losses? Take a shot. 
my favorite <laughs> little I, I think, oxymoron. I, if you're Tennessee, you've got to win against either Alabama or Georgia, and you've got to do it convincingly enough that you answer all questions. And that is just – that's real. You can lose one of the two of them, I think, but you've got to win one of the two of them. And you've got to win one of the two of them in a way that the committee can say, yeah, but – Look at this one over here, because you, you're absolutely right. The other thing, too, and I, I beg people to look at this number, game control in a week and a half will be a metric we start to see released. Game control, the committee looks at, right? And so some of these games where you're like, hey, this has been a, it was a tough win. They eked out a tough win. The committee will not see it that way. So, like, I do think it gets really tough when it's like just taking care of business ain't enough. And if you're Tennessee, you've also done one thing the committee hates, you're beating yourself. Turnovers, penalties. Bad situations, bad situational football. Committee doesn't like a team that they can easily say, like all those former coaches in the room and former ADs in the room see a team that beats itself, they knock them down. So I, I think there's a lot of lift left for you know either of these losers, but particularly if Tennessee loses to Alabama, man, I, that's that's a lot of lift they're going to have to get back through. Yeah, I, I'm with you that winning one of those two is absolutely necessary, but even that I think raises some questions. But again, we're all learning what life in a 12-team playoff looks like. We are all learning what 10 and 2 versus 9 and 3 looks like. We we don't know in this new era of the college football playoff. Um, okay, we've got one of the best slates of the year, I think, this weekend. Between last weekend and this weekend, these were the weekends that I circled in Sharpie and put a little gold sticker and a little, you know, little sparkles. And then I said, this is gonna be the best weekend ever. What are you binging, Fitz? Uh, I'm binging Georgia, Texas. I, you know, obviously, I, mean, uh, correct. I, I think the two we've talked about, like, but Georgia, Texas, particularly, is such a great test for both teams to get a real sense of where they are, to get a real sense of where Quinn Ewers is. This just feels like the sort of atmosphere that, that's going to be special. It's one of those moments I love what's happened in college football this year with the addition of Texas to the SEC. Georgia, Texas, it's just injected in my veins. If I can only watch one thing all weekend from any sport anywhere in the world, it's Georgia, Texas. I'm, it's those two games. It's Georgia, Texas. It's Alabama, Tennessee. And that Alabama, Tennessee game, frankly, feels a lot different now than maybe it felt a couple of weeks ago. When I thought we were going to get a, you know, a showdown of two undefeated teams, obviously that's not the case. But these feel like two games where everything is on the line. In an era of college football where everyone wants to complain about regular season games losing their luster, kind of losing their, their appeal. Uh, hello? What are you watching? Um, Adam accused us of being SEC homers. So let me just ask, let me check ourselves. Is there a binge game outside of the Southeastern Conference that we're missing? I don't – no, no, we're not. Um, I, Those I think, feel like the games, right? I think uh, I could take stream – like it, here, for Brenneman's sake, I'll take a stream game that most people might not be paying attention to, but I think it's going to be spectacular, and that's Indiana and Nebraska. Indiana, and that's such a Brenneman and, game. Like, like that's that it is like I know I, I, and when I when I saw it on the schedule my first thought was like oh, Adam's gonna be so proud when I mentioned this one no I think there's so much Nebraska we sort of wrote off and what have we done this year with several teams they they lose one game we write them off we did that with Nebraska we've written them off fact is they've been playing okay they've been getting better like they've still got a young quarterback that I think is a phenom right like so Indiana taking on Nebraska you've got a, a football team in Indiana that's far better than anyone expected and a Nebraska team that's right on the fringe. This to me is going to be a really good game. So there, there's my Brenneman love. Is there anything that's stand, like Brennanian that stands out to you? I just made that word up. Brennan. It's Brenneman. Bre maybe we give a Bremmy award. Brenny. The Bremmies. I like that. The Brennies. The Brennies. The Brennies. The Brennies. It goes to the most Midwestern blue collar, playing really good on both lines of scrimmage kind kind of football, and it's probably like a crisp like thirty five degrees, and it's gray outside. And like it's, that's it's, a that's a Brenneman classic, and it's got to have like this little when somebody says they're not watching it, it has to be responded to with the same level of like vitriol that comes when somebody says they've never seen Star Wars or whatever. You're like, what? I have How never seen Star possible? Wars. I quit. Is it too early just, to quit? There, it, it's, it's too many movies. It's overwhelming. I'm well, I, just I, go I, see the let's go see the first the theatrical first <sighs> one. Like there are certain no, cultural phenomena you just got to see. Like, look, I don't really care about the Godfather. Hot take, but I'm gonna. I've seen the Godfather. Like you got to see. Like I, Harry Potter isn't my thing, but I've seen the first God, one. Like Harry Potter's great. 
See, good. You'll love it because it's basically the same movie as Star Wars. You'll love it. I just, I, there's so many things I've been bullied into watching because it's like the cool thing to watch, like Game of Thrones. And no. Game of Thrones is Game great, of Thrones is just like we but, can say this on a podcast amongst friends. Game of Thrones is just Dungeons and Dragons with lots of nudity. That's all it is. And I'm not really into Dungeons and Dragons, so like I'm out on it. And, and yeah, I guess that's I guess that's true. It really is what it is. A lot of alcohol, a lot of boobs, yeah. a lot of dragons. Yeah, no, when I was on the tour bus, we always yeah. called it Game of Boobs. That was what the that was the what we made the name of the, the show. One of those shows that it just gets really awkward if you watch it with your parents. When I, you just I get, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go to the restroom really quick. I'll be right back. Is there, is there another game you want to stream? Maybe then we can give a Brenny to. Can yeah, a there Brenny? is. I don't know if this <laughs> is uh, to move on from boobs. Um, I don't know if this is a Brenneman game, but this is gonna be something for me moving forward. That any time a solid opponent plays Miami, it's gonna be. I'm not gonna say appointment watching, but I'm gonna say that's a game that I want to watch. So I'm watching, I'm streaming Miami Louisville this weekend. I think Louisville's a good team. I think they've shot themselves in the foot a few too many times and they've come out on the unlucky end of it. I think over the past couple of weeks, Miami has also shot themselves in the foot, but they've found ways to win. I love any opportunity I get to watch Cam Ward play football because he is so fun to watch play football, but Miami's escaped some close ones. So we're looking at Miami as a team that you and I, Fitz, both put in the college football playoff. We both feel like they could play perhaps a Clemson in the ACC title game, but this could be potentially a week where Miami trips up, where maybe, maybe Louisville proves to all of us that, hey, we counted them out too early. They're a team that isn't going to get to the playoff, but could make things really interesting in the ACC. So I'm going to stream that one. Can I can I give you a sicko game? A game that nobody's paying attention yeah. to but me? Yes. This again, this is a Brenny. Michigan State's taken on Iowa. Hear me out. Michigan State has lost oh, three straight games. Ew. All right. Michigan State has lost three straight games. One was to Boston College in a game that frankly they should have won. They choked in the last couple of minutes. And then they lose to Ohio State and Oregon, both by blowout scores. But in the first half of each, they were surprisingly competitive and I couldn't figure out why. So I'm interested after having a little bye week to sort of lick their their wounds and, and get back. Like Michigan State versus Iowa. This is a real moment for Michigan State to tell everybody who they are this year. Like I, I thought they were going to be dreadful. Instead, they might just be bad or they might be okay. And after this Iowa game, they get Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, three straight ranked opponents. I think they got to get if they want to have any shot at bowl eligibility in their first year with a new regime. They got to get a win here. I, I'm actually kind of excited to watch ugly football between Michigan State and Iowa. Whew. You know, it's a sicko game. When what you can take away from it could be, are they terrible or are they actually pretty good? <laughs> That's facts. Yeah. That's fair. It's, it's a sicko game whenever you can say, I can't wait to watch just some, you know, some gritty, grimy football. I'll give you another sicko game. And I think we are all going to be sickos because this game is on Friday night and we all live for Friday night college football. Florida State Duke. Oh. It doesn't, it, it feels like an icky gross game that probably has zero implications to anything in the conference and in terms of the national conversation, Florida State is truly, truly a dreadful football team. They It hurts my heart and my soul to watch Florida State, at least offensively. But why not? I'm going to watch it. It's on Friday night. Nothing else to watch. We've, we've gotten some juicy tea out of Friday night games in the past. The whole time I'm watching it, uh, I'm going to listen to Aerosmith, What It Takes, just on repeat, where the, he loudly, Steven Tyler loudly screams, tell me what it takes to let you go. And it, it's a song about a breakup, but the whole time I'm just going to be thinking, what is it going to take? How many more losses before, before Florida State boosters get together and they're like, I don't give a damn how much the yeah. buyout is. Get me out of this like there's just a there's only so much after the pain of being undefeated and not getting to play for a natty there is just no way that you can be prepared for the emotional letdown florida state fans have felt this year so steven tyler playing loudly on the sonos while i watch this game but you're right i'll, I'll watch it still i'm sick i'm gonna watch it and it's not even the pain that florida state fans have experienced this year as in like this season 
but the pain that they have experienced this calendar year. Because since the calendar has flipped to 2024, it has been nothing but pain. You go undefeated and you get, you, you know, you don't get included into the college football playoff. You get your butts kicked by Georgia. And then you lose to Georgia Tech and Boston College and everybody else on their schedule. There, I just pour one out for the Florida State fans in your life. And hey, Duke, they lost to Georgia Tech. They're coming off of a bye. They're going to be angry. Could see some fireworks. Does Duke never football know. get angry? I, I mean, like. Well, I mean, they may have just had midterms. Okay, so. yeah. They're angry about that. Yeah, that, that's fair. They're angry I'm throwing about shade that. at all. Like all the smart schools I've thrown shade at today. Let me just acquiesce, Vandy and, and Duke. Uh, you're all smarter than I am. You're just not great at football. Wake Forest. Anybody want to catch some strays? UNC. <laughs> Well, Wake Forest is the home of Krispy Kremes, and uh, I think we can all agree that Krispy Kremes are trash. They're not good donuts. Well, okay, so Chris, donuts, I think, are kind of like watch it. You know, they're like like even when it's bad, it's still good. Oh no, no, that's not true. Yeah, no, that's not yeah. true. Yeah, no, 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 like no. They're pizza. bad. Donuts. Even when it's bad, it's still pretty good. No, there's bad pizza too. Like, I mean. Uh, Caroline, you lived in in Connecticut long enough to know like good pizza versus bad pizza. Nashville's a Best pretty good pizza, pizza in the town. country. Yeah, no, but there there are bad donuts. Like, and it, that frankly, I like my donuts to be like cake donuts that are like you eat them and you say like every bite is like chewing through a huge piece of cake. That's what I want out of my donuts. That's not Krispy Kreme. Krispy Kreme's a disappointment. Not worth it. It's fried carbs and sugar. It's going to be yeah. awesome, no matter no, what it is. No, Some are just all, better no. than others. They're not created equally. This is where I have, you know, serious envy of anyone that went to the Red River rivalry because I saw photos of fried butter, fried Oreos, funnel cakes, obviously, corn dogs. Like, I'm telling, it's, I, if it's fried I mean, with sugar on top, it's going to be good. No, I, I made my living, you know, for years with the band. We played every county fair, city fair, state fair, country fair. We played every out. fair you could you could imagine. And everybody always wanted to go out and get a funnel cake after the show. Nah, funnel cakes are trash too. Like fried funnel butter, cakes are overrated. Delicious. Fried, fried Oreos, overrated. Like all that stuff. What? Like corn dogs are delightful, but like all the corn all the fried desserts delightful. with powdered sugar on them. Not nah. like also desserts are best served cold. I, I like I've got dessert tastes for days. As a and I was a fat kid, what? a very fat kids so like it miss me with the i don't know how to eat dessert so like, you're, I more, was, you're more qualified to have dessert takes yeah no no like i <laughs> ate my way through every dessert like i was the fattest kid in my middle school class so i i understand desserts like this is not this is not as you know skinny fit version of me giving bad dessert takes like the fat kid in me still knows a good dessert versus a bad dessert fitz hates field stormings and fried oreos just yeah, everything or good everything Oreo. good in life you're going to take all the good things away from us uh, but that is going to do it for us today. We miss you, Adam, but we know he's absolutely killing it on the Kennesaw State MTSU call, as I'm sure all of our listeners are tuning in tonight. But that's going to do it for us. We'll be back on Saturday. You can follow Fitz at Jason Fitz. I'm at Caroline Fenton One. Always appreciate you guys for being here, for hanging out with us, for being part of the conversation. So tell your friends, tell an Army fan, tell a Ohio State fan that wants to fire Ryan Day, we're here for everybody and we'll be here for you on Saturday night.